Okay, chemists, we're going to start our next unit on stereochemistry today. Stereochemistry has to do with stereoisomers, which are compounds that have the same chemical formula, but they exist differently in their arrangement in space, in other words, in 3D. Such as the two molecules that are right in front of you, these are examples of the molecule carvone, and they represent two different handed versions of the molecule. Uh, while the one on the right smells like spearmint, uh, the one on the left smells like caraway seeds. They have the same physical properties, melting point, boiling point, solubility, but they have different chemical properties. And the reason we smell them differently is because they interact differently uh, with chiral substances that are in our olfactory systems, in, in our noses. Uh, and this applies to all kinds of molecules, not just in the food industry, but in the drug industry. A very well-known example is the thalidomide molecule, while the one on the right acts as a sedative and was used to treat uh, morning sickness during early pregnancy in certain parts of the world in the 1950s. Uh, the molecule on the left is actually a teratogen. And when the thalidomide molecule was first made, it was actually made as a mixture of these two isomers. And this was really prior to scientists, scientists' understanding of stereoisomerism and the, the drastic differences that might ensue. So the molecule was made as a mixture, and it wasn't until many children were unfortunately born with birth defects uh, that they realized the consequences of these differences. Nowadays, much stricter legislation exists governing the regulation of molecules that have this stereoisomerism. Speaking of drug molecules, the last one that you see here is the ibuprofen molecule. Uh, the one on the right is the anti-inflammatory. Uh, the one on the left is actually an inert molecule. It doesn't really do anything. And fun fact, your body has a chemical mechanism which can actually convert the inert one into the active one. So ibuprofen is a drug that is sold as a mixture. And after it was determined what these different properties are for the two molecules, it can now safely be administered as these two different isomers where we know one is uh, perfectly safe and, and the other one's actually active in a beneficial way. So what we're gonna do today is look at these, these terms chirality and stereoisomerism as they apply to everyday objects and as they apply to organic compounds. So first of all, what makes a molecule or an object chiral? Well, chiral comes from the Greek word for handedness and something is chiral if it does not possess a plane of symmetry it will have a mirror image that is not identical to it. Um, something is achiral if it does have a plane of symmetry running down some axis in the center of it, and it does have an identical mirror image. So for example, that chair is an achiral object. It would be identical to its mirror image, and it has a plane of symmetry running right down the middle of it. As opposed to a pair of scissors, those are chiral, those are handed. Anybody that's left-handed knows that scissors are designed for uh, one type of user as opposed to the other. Likewise, a glove. Most gloves are chiral. They are a perfect example of something that's handed. A right-handed glove goes on your right hand as opposed to a left-handed glove. Uh, that sled looks to be achiral. That has a plane of symmetry running right down it, as does that glass of water. Uh, the taxi cab, I would argue, is chiral, though, because the driver sits on one side in the front seat as opposed to the other, certainly different in the United States as opposed to the United Kingdom. We could apply this to any number of objects. If we were together in person, I would have you scavenger hunt for chiral objects and eight chiral objects around you, just to fill in some blanks. Uh, golf clubs, corkscrews, shoes, those are all things that are handed in chiral, as opposed to baseball bats, uh, spoons, and simple t-shirts could be examples of things that are achiral. Although you could get picky and talk about the cotton that makes up the fibers of a typical t-shirt and cotton uh, which is usually made out of cellulose fibers, comes from chiral sugar molecules. Uh, so most natural things actually are chiral, and many man-made things fall into the achiral category because uh, humans seem to like symmetry, so they often make things that have symmetry to them. So what does this have to do with molecules? Let's look at the chirality in a molecule. Well, the most common chirality center that we're going to see is what's called an asymmetric carbon. And that exists when you have an sp3 hybridized carbon with four different atoms or groups of atoms, let's say substituents, attached to that carbon. So here are a number of examples. Some of these have asymmetric carbons, some of them do not. Some of them are chiral molecules and some of them are not. So for each one, 
we're going to find anywhere there's an asymmetric carbon, and we're going to place an asterisk next to it. And if it's a chiral molecule, we're going to draw its enantiomer, starting with the first one. This is a lactic acid molecule. And indeed, it has an asymmetric carbon right there in the middle. There are four different groups attached to that carbon, an OH, a methyl, an H, and the carboxylic acid. So that defines the asymmetric carbon. Now, if I had to draw the enantiomer of this, I could draw it exactly the same, but change the stereochemistry of that asymmetric carbon by just swapping two of the four groups. Let me show you what I mean. I'll draw the methyl in the same spot, the OH in the same spot, but I'm gonna invert where the CO2H group and the H group exist. I actually drew what's called the enantiomer of the original compound. These are enantiomers of each other. That's a word we give to mean a pair of substances that are non-identical mirror images. Just like your two hands are enantiomers of each other, they are not superimposable. They're very similar, made of the same building blocks, even with the same distance between groups, but they're not identical to one another. They are stereoisomers, specifically enantiomers of each other. Right next to it, molecule B, this is propanol. Uh, this does not have any asymmetric carbons. Every carbon has at least two of the same atom attached to it. There's two hydrogens right there. There's two hydrogens on that carbon. There's actually three hydrogens on that carbon. So no asymmetric carbons. Uh, and it's also just an achiral molecule overall. C, however, is chiral. It has an asymmetric carbon right there. And I could draw its enantiomer. I could try to draw the mirror image, what this would look like in a mirror plane, or I could draw it just in the same fashion, but invert the stereochemistry at the asymmetric carbon, just like we did in part A. And what I did there, as you can see, is I brought the OH coming out of the plane, and as a result, the H that used to be coming out of the page toward you, that is now going back into the page away from you. So we swapped two groups, and you overall get the inversion at that carbon. D is a chiral. There's no asymmetric carbons in molecule D. Likewise, in E, there are no asymmetric carbons. And in F, there are no asymmetric carbons. Those are all achiral examples. So I want you to just hit pause and take a look at the remaining two rows and start with just seeing if you can identify, are there any asymmetric carbons in those molecules? We'll come back and check, and then we'll talk about which ones we can draw an antimers for and which ones we can't. Try that now. All right, in G, we have a very three-dimensional molecule. This is one of those bicyclic species. There are two asymmetric carbons, and they are the bridgehead carbons. You might be going, why are those different from each other? Well, if I focus in on that carbon in the front, what's it attached to? Well, there's an H coming out of the page toward you. That's one thing. There's this sp2 carbon on the right. That's a second thing that's certainly different. Then I have a secondary carbon on the left that's attached to another secondary carbon as opposed to a secondary carbon on the top attached to a tertiary carbon. So those two carbons are not the same as each other. Just like up above, this methyl and this propyl are not the same as each other. That's, that's enough to desymmetrize the molecule and make that an asymmetric carbon. If I had to draw an enantiomer of this, one way would be to draw it very similarly, but I could just move that methyl down to the lower right. That is actually the mirror image of the original compound, and it's not identical. H has two asymmetric carbons in it. They're the ones with the chlorines attached. If we just zoom in on one of them, hopefully you can see why. There's the chlorine, there's the hydrogen, there's the CH2 group, and then there's the CH with a chlorine on it. So again, those two carbons, they're both carbon atoms, but they are attached to different things farther out in the molecule and they desymmetrize that spot. Same with this carbon here. They're both asymmetric carbons. Now this is a very special type of molecule, however, because even though it contains asymmetric carbons, there is a plane of symmetry running right down in the middle of that line right there. So overall, this is an achiral molecule. However, it has asymmetric carbons. And we talk about this special combination very specifically when you see this because this thing doesn't have an enantiomer. It has asymmetric carbons, but it is identical to its mirror image.
So we give this a special name. We call this a meso compound from the Greek for middle, uh, probably referring to where you can draw a plane of symmetry down the middle of it. So a special class of compounds called meso compounds are where you have those two criteria. It contains asymmetric carbons, but it doesn't have an enantiomer. It's achiral overall. That means we're only going to see meso compounds when you have at least two centers of asymmetry, two asymmetric carbons in this case. Right next to it, uh, this is the carbon molecule that we looked at up above, or one of them. There's an asymmetric carbon at the bottom of the six-membered ring. And if I had to draw the enantiomer of this, I would draw everything in the same fashion, but I'll invert the stereochemistry at that spot right there, and I'll give that isopropenyl group a dashed line instead of a bold line. That would be the enantiomer. Next to it, that's the ibuprofen molecule. There's an asymmetric carbon right there with the methyl and a dashed line. How do I draw the enantiomer? I could draw it in the same fashion, paying close attention to when I get to the asymmetric carbon, which is that methyl, and simply invert the stereochemistry at that spot. That's the enantiomer of the original ibuprofen. K is really similar to the one we had a few structures ago, but it's not a meso compound. This also has two asymmetric carbons, but this one does have an enantiomer. If you draw the five-membered ring again and invert the stereochemistry at both positions, whoops, that's the same one. Let me change one. Let me make the chlorine at the top a dashed line, and the chlorine down here a bold line. That is not the same compound. Those are two different representations of uh, a stereoisomer. In this case, I see a reflection plane right there as if this molecule is looking at its reflection, but they're not superimposable. That's very hard to see, I think, at this stage. It will get better as we do more practice, but this is not a meso compound. It has an enantiomer. It's overall chiral. Uh, the last one we have here, for some reason there's a squiggle line there, just cyclohexane. This is just a chiral, no asymmetric carbons. Okay, let's wrap up and look at the last row. In M, this is an example of an amino acid. There's an asymmetric carbon right where the methyl is attached to this. I believe this is alanine. So this has an enantiomer. I will draw it by inverting the stereochemistry at the one asymmetric center and bring that methyl toward me. Uh, right next to it, benzene is just a chiral. There's no sp3 carbons, so there's no asymmetric carbons. Remember, it has to be sp3 in order for the carbon to be asymmetric. O is a glucose molecule, and there are many asymmetric carbons in this. Five of the six carbons are asymmetric, all the carbons in the ring. I'm actually going to redraw that chair representation as a flat hexagon and show direction with all of those OH and CH2OH groups attached so that we can more easily draw the enantiomer. So there's a different representation of the same molecule, just no longer drawn in a chair. Now, if I want to draw the enantiomer, I can draw it in the same fashion, but invert every single asymmetric carbon, and there are five of them going around the ring. So that CH2OH group, I'll draw with a dashed line. That OH in the upper left, I'll draw with a bold line. That OH in the lower left, I'll draw with a dashed line. That OH at the very bottom, I draw with a bold line. And that OH in the lower right, I draw with a dashed line. Those are two enantiomers of glucose. And this is a sneak preview of something maybe you realize, wow, what if you just change some of the asymmetric carbons and not all of them? Yes, we have ways of describing those as well. For now, we're just talking about enantiomers, but there are other stereoisomers coming. Uh, in B, we have an achiral molecule. There's no asymmetric carbons. Uh, Q is another example of a meso compound. So this has two asymmetric carbons but there is a plane of symmetry running right down the middle of that carbon-carbon bond in the center. And then lastly, even though this is in a chair, this is an achiral compound. There are no asymmetric carbons. Perhaps it's easier to see if you draw it in a flat hexagon representation with the T-butyl at the bottom and the methyl at the top. There's a plane of symmetry running right down the middle through those bonds. So sometimes you have to look for the plane of symmetry it's not as apparent. Okay, so asymmetric carbons are our most common chirality center. They have to be sp3 carbons with four different atoms or four different groups of atoms, and sometimes the differences are subtle. If carbon is attached to more carbons as opposed to oxygens and hydrogens, 
those two carbons become different. Going forward, we'll see how this applies to how we name these types of molecules uh, and what they mean for the consequences of chemical reactions.